Leviticus chapter 25. <clears throat> Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Leviticus 25, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, it may surprise you to, to uh, know that the Israelites are still at Mount Sinai. They've been there, uh, well, since about halfway through the book of Exodus. And here they are getting toward the end of Leviticus, and they're still there. Because remember, that's where Moses received this law, on top of Mount Sinai. And uh, the God, or I should say the law that God gave on Mount Sinai, took effect immediately, <clears throat> but it would still apply to them when they get into the promised land. And so these principles are for the Israelites when they are in the wilderness and also some of them strictly for when they are in the promised land, as we will see in this chapter. Verse 2, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Every seven years was a year of rest for the land. You know, God gave everybody a Sabbath, even the land. And I guess this is scientifically smart, agriculturally smart. But I think it also was given to keep Israel from becoming greedy and covetous. Give the land rest, don't plant any crops in the seventh year. And you know, later on, they did get greedy, and they broke this law. In fact, in fact, they broke this law for many, many, many years in a row. And it is one of the sins that sent the nation into Babylonian captivity. Verse 3, and here we go. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. God knows everything there is to know about farming, obviously. And so he tells them what to do here. Give the land a rest. People have to learn the hard way when they don't follow the principles found in the Word of God. As I have heard or read, this is years ago, years ago some southern land in the United States became very unproductive because they just plant and planted cotton year after year after year without giving the land a rest. Drain the land dry. Five, that which grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap. Neither gather the grapes of your vine undressed, for it is a year of rest to the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, shall be food for you, for you and for your servant and for your maid and for your hired servant and for your stranger that sojourns with you and for your cattle and for the beasts that are in your land shall all the increase thereof be food. So, God did not let the people or the animals in the land of Israel starve every seven years. He didn't say you're going to have to fast for 365 days because you're not plant, planting anything. No, the land was so blessed that it didn't have to be planted every year. The crops would just grow automatically. And they were not to be harvested for market that year. Instead, they were to be eaten by the owner and by the servants, and by the poor of the land, and, and also by animals. 8. And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years to you. So that would be 49 years. Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty and nine years. Then shall you cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the Day of Atonement, shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hollow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee to you 
and you shall return every man to his possession, and you shall return every man to his family. People could mortgage their land if they got in trouble financially, but in the, in the year of Jubilee, all land returned to its original owner. And also, if a man was sold into indentured slavery, he couldn't pay off a debt, sold himself as a, as a slave, he was set free also on year 50, on the Jubilee year. And actually, the year of Jubilee was a type of this age of grace. And that's because today, the gospel of salvation is preached to people who are slaves of Satan and slaves of sin. And God will set you free. If you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and ask him to deliver you, believe me, one way or another, he'll set you free. It's a year of Jubilee. You don't have to be a slave to Satan. You don't have to be a slave to sin. God will, get, God will set you free. It's a year of Jubilee. It's the age of Jubilee. 11. A Jubilee shall that 50th year be to you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which grows of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of your vine undressed. For it is the Jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. And remember the Jubilee year? Remember this. It's every, every 50 years, right? It followed seven Sabbath years. So the Jubilee year followed a Sabbath year. That meant that for two years the land would not be planted or harvested. Two years. The people would have to trust God to meet their needs. And he did. What a deal. Actually, what a great deal. You could have two years off, two whole years off, and God would just supply your needs. Now that's living. 13. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy anything of your neighbor's hand, you shall not, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy of your neighbor and according to the number of years of the fruits he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years you shall increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years you shall diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits does he sell to you. And then verse 17, You shall not therefore oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Be fair to one another. Take care of one another. Treat each other right. So when it was necessary to sell one's land, the price was to be computed on the basis of how many harvests were left before the year of the Jubilee. So that way the person who, who bought the land would be paying a fair price. 18. Wherefore you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and you shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And if you shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And you shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. Because God is in control. God determines harvests. Keeping the Sabbath years and the year of Jubilee was an act of faith. It's true. A person had to believe that God would keep his word and God would meet their needs as he promised he would. God says, if you believe me, I'll protect you from starvation. I'll take care of you. You got to believe me. Believe me, obey me, I'll take care of you. Same thing is true today. The Bible says to Christians, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the other things that you need will be added unto you. 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. 
You're just tenants. That's what God says. And I like that. I like it. 24. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. The Israeli government did not own the land. This wasn't communism or fascism. The people didn't own the land. It wasn't free enterprise. God Almighty owned that land. He owns all land. He owns the earth. And he just allotted a portion of it to each tribe in Israel and each family within the tribe, and he wanted it to stay in the family. That's why every 50th year he gave it all back to the original owners. 25. If your brother be waxed poor and has sold away some of his possessions, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the surplus to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that has bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return to his possession. So if an Israelite would fall into hard financial times, and would therefore be forced to sell a portion of their land, a near relative could redeem it. In other words, a near relative could buy it back for them. Or if he had no near relative to buy it, maybe in the future he would have the means to buy it back himself. If that was not an option, well, it would still be returned to him, if nothing else, in the year of Jubilee, 29. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the jubilee. But the houses of the villages which have no wall around about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out in the jubilee. Notwithstanding, the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession may the Levites redeem at any time. And if a man purchase of the Levites in the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall go out in the year of jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the suburbs or the pasture lands of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possessions. There were two, two exceptions to the redemption of property. Number one, if a house in a walled city was sold, it was not returned in the year of Jubilee. And also, if a person who sold their house had up, any person who sold their house, I should say, had up to one year to redeem it, and afterwards it became the permanent property of the buyer. And the second exception would be the Levites. They always had the right to redeem their property, and if they didn't, if they couldn't, it was always returned to them in the year of Jubilee. 35. And if your brother be waxed poor and fallen in decay with you, then you shall relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you, and take no usury, no interest of him, or increase, but fear your God, that your brother may live with you. You shall not give him your money upon interest, nor lend him your food supplies for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. God is a God of common decency. And we see that in his laws. Common sense, common decency. And it's reflected in his law concerning helping a poor person. God says, be generous to the needy. 
and don't take advantage of them in their hard times when, when somebody is vulnerable. Don't take advantage of them by trying to make a profit off of their poverty. 39. And if your brother that dwells by you be waxed poor and be sold to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a bondservant. Don't treat him as a common slave, like he was property. He's God's property, not your property. And if your brother that dwells by you be waxed poor and be sold to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as a hired servant, as an employee. And as a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you to the year of Jubilee. 41. Then shall he depart from you, both he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family, and to the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, not your people, they're not your slaves. Hebrews are not your slaves. They're my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. You shall not rule over them with rigor, but shall fear your God. The Israelites had enough of that garbage when they were slaves down in Egypt. The Egyptians ruled over them with rigor and oppressed them, treated them like property. God says, you're not going to do that to your fellow Hebrew who falls into hard times. You treat them decently and fairly. 44. Both your bondmen and your bondmaids, which you shall have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall you buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall you buy, and of their families that are with you, which they fathered in your land, and they shall be your possession. And you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over, rule one over another with rigor. So Gentile slaves were slaves for life in Israel and could even be inherited as property. And, and that may trouble some of you. But you got to understand this within the context of the times. You have to remember that God is, number one, more concerned about a person's eternal soul than their temporary existence here on earth. And a Gentile outside of Palestine, a Gentile outside of Israel, would just drown in a sea of idolatry, die and go to hell. But a Gentile slave in Israel could be circumcised and be brought into the covenant with God and actually be saved. So becoming a, sla a slave to an Israelite would, could be the best thing that ever happened to them. At least it gave them a shot at being saved. 47. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by you, and your brother that dwells by him wax poor and sell himself to the stranger or sojourner by you, or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is near kin, near of kin to him, of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now this is the law that God established. And everybody, including foreigners, better obey it. 15. He shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him to the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale shall be according to the number of years, according to the time of a hired servant shall it be with him. Again, God wants us to be done fairly for everybody involved. 51. If there be yet many years behind, according to them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there be, if there remain but few years to the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according to his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with vigor over him in your sight. And if he be not redeemed in, in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For to me the children of Israel are servants, 
They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so again, he mentions no Hebrew servant is going to be a, a, a permanent slave of anybody because they're mine. I bought them. I redeemed them. I purchased them out of Egypt. A Hebrew who, because of poverty, became a slave of a foreigner was to be purchased by a relative, if at all possible. If there was no relative willing and able to do it, then he and his family, if nothing else, were to be released in the year of Jubilee. 